Welcome to this concise video log on reducing cardiovascular risk in an older woman with HIV. This program is provided by Clinical Care Options and is supported by independent educational grants from Gilead Sciences, Merck Sharp and Dome Corp, and Vive Healthcare. This blog was recorded by Professor Jens Lundgren. Please note his disclosures on this slide. This blog is part of a comprehensive educational program on caring for aging patients with HIV. You can gain CME, CE, or CPE credit for viewing these vlogs and download the slides by visiting our website, clinicaloptions.com. So hi, uh, I'm Jens Lundgren from Elizabeth Taylor, the University of Copenhagen. Um, I just saw a patient who encompasses challenges uh, of case management uh, that I often encounter in my, in my older patients. Uh, so my plan was to go through uh, some of the details of this particular patient. So let me introduce you to uh, a patient, Mrs. D, uh, a 58-year-old woman who was diagnosed with HIV in 2000, 20 years ago. She has been on multiple ART regimens uh, and is currently receiving uh, the Renovia uh, uh, in combination with VTC and Abacavir. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes five years ago uh, and is currently smoking between 15 and 20 cigarettes a day with an accumulative 30 pack years. Uh, she is not infected with viral hepatitis. On the right side, you can see uh, she is well controlled, have a high CD4 cell count, is obviously HLA B5701 negative. She's taking the back of here. Her BMI is, is elevated, 30. She has increased blood pressure, in particular, the systolic blood pressure. Her, her lipids is also perturbed uh, with an increased cholesterol level. Also increased ALT, suggesting some type of liver involvement. Uh, her estimated GFR is uh, below 90, 70, not really uh, dramatically low. Uh, and then there is evidence of uh, not optimal glucose control with the hemoglobin A1C um, of 55, uh, where the upper limit should be 48, or equivalent to 7.3%, uh, where the upper limit is 7%. So essentially, uh, we have a patient here. She's uh, virally well treated, uh, but have multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. She has hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia, type two diabetes, uh, and where we really want to see whether we should we could prioritize uh, uh, because there's so many different factors here. Uh, prioritize hypertension and smoking. She has ALT elevation. Uh, she is at least not recording alcohol uh, consumption at increased rate. And we know that she is not uh, violently uh, infected. Uh, so this could be relating to her uh, obesity. Her estimated GFR is 70 milliliters per minute, not dramatically low. Uh, is there actually uh, an explanation for this? Uh, um, is it related to uh, possibly a poorly managed hypertension? Uh, is it some of the drugs she's receiving against her HIV that is uh, part of that? So these are sort of the aspects that I would like to discuss uh, uh, on, in the next uh, few minutes. So of course, when you see a patient of this type and where the focus is on cardiovascular risk, I think it's really, really important that we start uh, by quantifying the risk. Not only so we can make sort of sound clinical determinations of what we should do. Uh, many guidelines are, are essentially circling around the, the estimated risk of cardiovascular disease, but also so we can present these results to the patient for the point, of course, of saying, if we actually do something, we can actually change the trajectory and your risk uh, over the next five to 10 years, for example. So you can see on the left side here, uh, she has a pretty uh, in, uh, elevated risk, and also not only because of her underlying risk, but also because she's using uh, a Bacavir. So there's a lot of things we can do for this patient uh, to improve her cardiovascular status. We can actually change the underlying risk of myocardial infarction uh, fairly dramatically. In terms of prevention, there's obviously many things we can do. This is from the European Age Clinical uh, Society guidelines, version 10, that was released last November. We have assessed the cardiovascular risk. We obviously will need to discuss smoking. We need to deal with blood pressure. We need to get the systolic blood pressure at least below 140 and likely below 130. We probably 
since she hasn't already established cardiovascular disease, coagulation inhibition is not really warranted. So there is an issue potentially with slight glucose dysmetabolism, and then she has this lipidemia. So there's a lot of things we should do here in order to see whether we can achieve those target values that you can see in the bottom of this slide. Now, one thing that I just want to say in relation to this is that different people say, oh, we need to do this uh, and we need to do that. But let me just make sure I really emphasize that certain interventions are much more effective in reducing cardiovascular risk compared to others. Um, smoking cessation is, is really effective. Reducing uh, blood pressure uh, and treat uh, um, glucose uh, disbalance um, and, and dyslipidemia uh, gives uh, some effect. Uh, uh, modifying antimal treatment help a little bit, depending, of course, which drug you are on. But it's really when you do it in combination that you see a quite striking uh, results. Uh, um, but uh, at the same time, you can't do everything at the same time. Uh, so you need to really say, what, what, do I, what should I do to begin with? And then make a plan maybe over the next six months, maybe over the next year, uh, where you do the things, you change medication, you give medication, uh, and then at the same time, uh, talk to the patient about the, this risk and see whether the sort of lifestyle factors uh, can also be modified. She was on a Darunavir, and there's data to at least suggest uh, uh, that cumulative exposure to Darunavir uh, may be associated with a slight increased risk of, of cardiovascular disease. Uh, uh, and also, as you saw, she was also on a Bacavir. So, so already from the antimal treatment uh, aspect, uh, uh, there are certainly other options out there at the moment uh, that we can consider uh, and, and change the patient's antimal treatment to. And of course, as HIV physicians, that's what we focus on. But please don't forget all the other factors that you've mentioned. Now, one thing uh, when we focus on the hypertension is to just remember <laughs> two things. Um, some of the antihypertensive, anti in, in particular, the calcium uh, channel blockers and the beta blockers, uh, they don't go well together with the P450 inhibitors. And uh, she is on Cubisistat. Uh, so if we can avoid using a, 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 a P450 inhibitor, that gives us much more leeway in terms of, uh, of uh, the, ch the choices uh, for treating her hypertension. So probably we would take the patients off boosted the Runavir and switch the Bacavir to a different uh, in RTI. Uh, what drug to change uh, the Runavir could be that uh, uh, obviously not to another protease inhibitor, but uh, maybe an integrase inhibitor would be relevant to, to consider in this patient, an unboosted integrase inhibitor. Um, now, she is at, at fairly elevated risk. You remember she had an estimated DFR of 70 milliliters per minute. Uh, uh, so, so the risk of actually developing uh, what we call chronic kidney disease uh, defined was uh, consecutive levels of estimated DFR less than, uh, less than 60 uh, is pretty high. I mean, there's not a lot of leeway in between current state uh, and progressing to that. Uh, um, so at least we should consider uh, whether we want to, when we do the switch, uh, to do, uh, do a switch to something that is quote unquote quit, uh, kidney friendly. Uh, so for example, the combination of uh, dolutegavir 3TC uh, of course, provided, and we will know that she has been on treatment for 20 years, uh, uh, has she actually had a violent failure on a 3TC, FTC uh, component? Uh, so has she already acquired resistance against that? Then maybe this is not the right idea to do that. Uh, um, uh, but if not, and she's been well suppressed throughout, uh, that could be a consideration. Uh, um, <clears throat> We can debate, uh, and that's been debated a lot, whether this patient uh, should be uh, placed on tenofovir or whether the patient sh should be placed on TAF. I think many clinicians would probably uh, choose uh, TAF, uh, but that can be debated. Certainly, if her estimated DFR was below 60, uh, TAF would be the appropriate drug to, to give. Uh, 
So that this is one of the combinations that you could switch her to. Now, smoking is really critical, and I don't need to tell you this. You have heard this over and over again, and we all talk about this. Um, we see an impact uh, on uh, um, myocardial risk in, in smokers that obviously, and that's important, and also to tell the patient that, that there is now substantive data that your risk of myocardial infarction uh, is reduced, not necessarily immediately once you stop smoking, uh, but there is clear evidence uh, that it is reduced after one uh, to two years. There are multiple studies to support that statement. Uh, so this is really an effective uh, intervention. It's difficult. Uh, we know that uh, there is um, many different ways of, of doing this. The ES guidelines are, uh, have a whole structure to describe how to do this. Uh, is the patient uh, willing to quit? Uh, uh, if, if yes, uh, Think about pharmacotherapy, cognitive behavioral counseling could be helpful uh, in that first sort of three to six months uh, uh, if the patient is willing uh, and motivated to get, uh, uh, get off the cigarettes. Uh, um, uh, but it is difficult and we know that. Um, but um, I guess the best way to say that to this patient is uh, if we do nothing, uh, uh, this is actually going to be a problem for you. And the, the, the question is whether you want to, to, to accept that risk or whether you want to, to change your lifestyle. And uh, uh, this is the right age to do that. Uh, remember that cancer risk, uh, clearly lung cancer risk, uh, um, is obviously related to, to smoking, as we all know. Uh, uh, what is a little bit uh, disturbing is that reversion of risk once you uh, stop smoking in terms of cancer risk uh, is not seen immediately, uh, probably because uh, uh, the, the smoking uh, is inducing mutations uh, that and where there needs to be an accumulation of uh, mutations, uh, oncogenic inducing uh, mutations of the cells in the lungs uh, before you do that transformation to, to, to lung cancer. In terms of hypertension, just to say that the newest guidelines actually separate hypertension management in patients with uh, HIV uh, depending on age, less than 55 as opposed to uh, 55 years or older. Specifically in that latter category is also people of black race uh, since uh, uh, the increased propensity uh, to develop hypertension. Uh, so for those less than 55, uh, an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker is the preferred drug, whereas for uh, the latter group, those above 55, uh, uh, probably a calcium channel blocker is the correct one. And then depending on how it goes with the single agent, uh, you can then intensify if you don't have sufficient control of, of blood pressure uh, by combining the two agents or include a, a, a diuretic, a, a tyrosine a type diuretic. Now, one thing that uh, I just want to also emphasize here, this is a woman and there is now accumulating data to uh, emphasize that uh, although we, the, the stereotype of cardiovascular disease is a man 55 years old and things like that, Women, of course, also develop cardiovascular disease. And as, as physicians, we may not have been as observant around that, that women are at risk as well. And again, um, I think that's something we should uh, correct and make sure we, um, uh, we do better. Uh, and I'm sure that is done also. Uh, but just to have that conversation also, uh, I think it's important. Now, one thing to also say in relation to cardiovascular risk uh, that not only are we talking about uh, issues uh, to the coronary system, uh, but there's also accumulating evidence uh, that is recently published that at least for women that elevated cardiovascular risk is also associated uh, with the cognitive uh, function uh, during follow-up uh, measured by this uh, NPSET four score. And interestingly, uh, that association was seen for women and not clearly for men. Um, uh, so uh, uh, another argument for see whether we can reduce uh, cardiovascular risk. Another aspect of talking to the patient around and at least making sure that you are fully aware of the stroke and 
typically uh, we have just talked about stroke as one entity, but it's not, of course, it's uh, either hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke. There's recent publications from the DID study to suggest that, that the risk factors for those two uh, phenotypes of stroke uh, actually differs. Um, hypertension is more important for hemorrhagic than ischemic. Uh, old age is important for both of them. Uh, importantly, uh, hemorrhagic strokes uh, uh, are a risk factor has, is a, a prior low CD4 cell count, so probably some of the potential opportunistic CNS infections can, can perturb and, and lead to hemorrhagic uh, stroke. And then uh, smoking, on the other hand, uh, is not necessarily related to hemorrhagic stroke, but, uh, but certainly to ischemic stroke. So uh, focus on hypertension and smoking uh, is really a good idea. I just wanted to end here by saying that um, this is a, uh, Mrs. D. She's a, a dear lady. Uh, she is uh, full of life. She wants to uh, uh, see her grandchildren um, grow up. Um, um, she's motivated for changing. Uh, you have a lot of things that you can guide her through uh, um, in terms of uh, reducing her risk. Uh, um, and. Um, but it's you who can help her to do that, but she also needs to be motivated to do that. You can change medication and she can change her, her lifestyle. So uh, I think with those uh, remarks, uh, just uh, good luck with, uh, with your care and management and uh, empathy for, for your HIV patient. Thank you very much. Take care.